to do a conference anytime soon, I want to give you a big important tip. What you want to do is close to the end of the second day, you want to put exciting and amazing speakers. Those people that everybody want to see. This is how you keep the people in the room. And this is exactly what we did. And this is exactly what we have now. I want to call the moderator of the next session um, an analyst, an author, an amazing hacker, a researcher here at the ICRC, a great speaker, Karen Elazari. The stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. High five. Woo! All right, ladies and gentlemen, for the last session of the plenary talks here at Cyber Week 2017, we really saved the best for last. You know what they say about what comes at the end? It's dessert. And this session right now is the hack the human session. For me personally, it's always been the most exciting session at Cyber Week. In the past few years, we've spoken about hacking into people's brains, reading their dreams. We spoke about hacking pacemakers and insulin pumps. We went where nobody else did. This year, we're taking it one step further. This year, we're going to go beyond the body beyond the mind. We're going to hack into the human psyche, into our psychology, our behaviors, our most vulnerable points, our most intimate wishes, and we're gonna go even further into the future with a very exciting talk about nanotechnology. But there's still time for that. Before we get into nanotechnology and before we get into the hacking of the future, we're gonna start where it hurts us most our souls, our psychology. Our first speaker of the day is Dr. Mary Aiken. The CSI Cyber Television Show is based on her research and on her work. She is an incredible speaker and author. She is a forensic cyber psychologist. And if you've never met a forensic cy cyber psychologist, you're gonna meet one right now, so get ready. She's also a member of the strategic advisory group for Paladin Capital. Please help me by giving a very warm Tel Aviv welcome to Dr. Mary Aiken. Please, Mary. Please. The stage. Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. So. I'm a forensic cyber psychologist, and I'm going to talk to you today about the impact of technology on the human. So basically, what is cyber psychology? Cyber psychology is the study of the impact of technology on human behavior. It's an advanced discipline within applied psychology, and it's only about 15 years old as a discipline. My area is forensic cyber psychology. So I specialize in deviant, criminal, and abnormal behavior online. And believe me, there's plenty of work in that space. So I like this slide because it sums up the symbiotic relationship between the so-called real world and the cyber world. What happens in the cyber world impacts on the real world and vice versa. So there's this symbiotic relationship between the two. If you go back to the work of Licklider, the paper 1960, where he wrote about man-computer symbiosis, and ultimately this was pre-technology as we know it now, pre-internet, but it's a wonderful example of instead of looking at artificial intelligence AI, really to focus on intelligence amplification, IA, and place the human at the center of technology. So my job as a cyber psychologist is to work at the intersection between humans and technology, or as law enforcement say, Mary works where humans and technology collide. I'm the academic advisor to Europol, to the Cybercrime Center. The Cyber Matrix. So, I've been involved in a dozen different research areas. And the one thing I've observed is that whenever technology interfaces with base human behavior, the result is an amplification and escalation. And from a scientific point of view, this points to the mutation of behavior in cyber contexts. So we have established state and trait behaviors within cyber psychology. For example, the online disinhibition effect. 
So the online disinhibition effect, which is the work of Suller, 2004, dictates that people do things in a cyber context that they would not do in the real world. So whether you're a toddler with an iPad, or whether you're a teenager, or whether you're a, somebody in your 20s, or whether you're a criminal population, human behavior can mutate and change in cyber contexts. I wrote a book about it called The Cyber Effect. I think this effect is the E equals MC squared of this century. If we can figure out this amplification, then we can also figure out how to de-escalate. So whether you are a cyber juvenile delinquent, or a lone cyber criminal, or a hacker, or a state-sponsored threat actor, or a member of an organized cyber crime gang, the one thing that you all have in common is that you are human. And the one thing that is unique to human behavior is motive. So in cyber psychology, we talk about primary motive, sustaining motive, overlapping motives, and primary and secondary gains. And in fact, I played the cyber simulation game here on Sunday um, at the conference, and everybody was focused on the digital forensics. Everybody was focused. It was a, a simulated global hacking event. And it went on for five hours. It was an incredible experience. But while everybody was looking at the political impact, the digital forensics, the attack surface, the one thing that I was focused on was motive and mapping out what was happening. And I, I'm happy to say that my team did extremely well. We gamed the game. So let's talk a little about the Sony hack. I didn't actually work on this, so I'm going to talk about it theoretically, hypothetically. Effectively, what was the motive for Sony to be hacked? Conventional wisdom says that it was actually to stop the release of the movie. But what happened? The movie actually was released by a company called Jedward on a URL that they bought for $4.99 from GoDaddy. So if the initial motive, the primary motive, was to stop the movie being released, then it was not a sustaining motive. So that URL was not attacked. Anybody used a credit card on it, their, their accounts weren't compromised. So therefore, was it about the movie? So if we look at it in terms of a typology, and this typology is, leads to the creation of a deductive cybercriminal profile. So if the movie got released, then maybe it wasn't about the movie. I'm not saying that North Korea didn't jump in once the door was open, but the question is, who opened the door? And effectively, if you look at this in another way, you would say that Amy Pascal was the victim because she actually lost her job as a result of what happened. And if you're looking at creating a group of suspects in terms of motive, I would look at anybody that she had sent an aggressive email to or had had confrontation with within the industry in her business. So I would say the thing is, is allow the data to speak to you and don't jump to actually side with conventional wisdom because there may be more to it than it seems. And sometimes the truth is there, hidden in plain sight. I'm going to just touch on anonymity online, or should I say perceived anonymity online. And I think that one of the big questions about human behavior online is that anonymity is a superpower, a superhuman power, the power of invisibility. But it comes with great responsibility. And as humans, are we capable of dealing with that level of power? I think there may come a time where we have to question anonymous protocols online. Because what happens in a cyber context, in cyber society, will impact on our real world society. We've just heard a talk about a, you know, the need for regulation and governance online. I don't think we'll ever be able to regulate at the speed at which the technology evolves, but it certainly doesn't mean that we can't have governance or some form of good practice. Online syndication. This is a theoretical construct that comes from, from my work in cyber psychology. And really it's the mathematics 
of criminal or abnormal behavior online. So I want you to think about it this way. To date, the incidence in the general population of this type of negative behavior online has been bound or capped by the laws of probability and domain. What does that mean? It means that if I'm a sex offender living in the north of the country and you're a sex offender, not pointing at anybody in particular, living in the south of the country, then what was the probability of us coming across each other and then normalizing and socializing our behavior? So it was limited by the geographical factor. But now, under the cover of anonymity and fueled by online disinhibition, negative actors, threat actors, can actually syndicate to find each other online and then normalize and socialize that behavior. I mean, as humans, we're, we're, we're reasonably simple creatures in some ways. If, we look, if it looks like everybody is doing it, then sometimes, we'll, well, why shouldn't I do it? So my prediction is, and I hope I'm wrong, but I'm probably not, is that this will actually drive the incidence of these abnormal and criminal behaviors in, in terms of general population. And that's a problem. A friend of mine from Interpol has said that we are facing a tsunami of criminality coming at us down the line online. And my work is really to try to get people to pay attention to the space. So last year, NATO declared cyberspace as a domain, a domain of operations, which effectively means a domain of war. People like me, cyber psychologists, have been talking for years about cyberspace as an environment, somewhere where you go, domain, chat room, forum, somewhere where you go. Have you ever sat down to just to finish an email before you go out for dinner and all of a sudden an hour has gone by. That's a time distortion effect as you get into this space. And at the moment, don't forget, we're talking really about transactional, my phone over here, my computer on my desk. The point at which we get into virtual reality and HMDUs is the point at which we are not going to be only psychologically immersed in cyberspace, we're going to be physically in the space as well. And this is powerful. And if we go back to psychology and look at environmental psychology, environment actually impacts on behavior. So again, I believe that to a certain extent, the behavioral scientists have been blindsided by rapid evolutions in technology. When I studied psychology back in the day, everything changed when I first came across artificial intelligence in the late 90s. And what occurred to me was that nothing in my studies up to that point equipped me to understand the profound and pervasive impact of technology on the human as an individual and on society as a group. So this is a rat, but not as you know it. This is routine activity theory. So this is a theoretical construct that comes from real-world criminology in terms of geographical profiling. So the point, again, coming back to the scientific empirical aspect, the one question as scientists, as academics, as researchers, as students that we have to ask ourselves is, are theories that have been conceptualized, hypothesized, tested, and validated in real-world constructs are they still applicable online? So if we look at theories of criminal behavioral profiling, we have personality theories, we have labeling theories, and we have geographical profiling theories. So in this theory, we take a topography, this is a map of London, and you might have a cluster of crimes. I've got a pointer, so <laughs> say they're top right. So effectively, we would look at triangulation. So we'd look at, the perp we'd look at a hypothetical positioning of the perpetrator, perpetrator, where they live, where they work, where they play. And then we would rotate that triangulation with the crime clusters along the buffer zones connecting. Because the point is there's going to be a buffer around perpetrator, live, work, and play. And crimes will take place on those pathways between live, work, and play. 
So now let's take that concept of routine activity theory and transpose it to cyberspace, a domain. And effectively, what have we got? Cyber routine activity theory, surface web to deep web. So this is the show CSI Cyber. As an educator, it was incredible to, to be able to not only entertain, but to educate at the same time. The show stay, airs in 170 countries. Patricia Arquette plays me in the show, and believe me, that is as surreal as it sounds. I never get used to that. So I'm gonna skip that one. If anybody is interested in reading more about cyber psychology and the impact of technology on the human behavior, please have a look at my book, The Cyber Effect. And finally, I'm gonna finish up with a philosophical existential question. In terms of causation correlation, does technology cause bad behavior? I don't think so. In terms of the connectedness of the internet, unprecedented connectivity, it may be that technology and the internet per se has enabled us to shine a very bright light into the darkest reaches of the human psyche, what Jung called the two million year old man. And maybe we're all just Game of Thrones underneath it all. Thank you.